So thanks for, for joining us to, to talk about telehealth today and really hoping that, um, you know, some of the content today in the conversation can really benefit you and in your school or your community in terms of thinking about how to, you know, proceed with kind of structuring your telehealth program. Um, as Song said, I'm Robbie. I work with Blue Path Health. Um, we're a consulting firm based out of the Bay Area. Um, and I think work on a couple relevant projects to the conversation today. Um, I help to manage and staff the Telehealth Policy Coalition in California. Um, that's convened um, by the, the Center for Connected Health Policy, which is the National Telehealth Resource Center. Um, and also I'm involved with um, a couple um, state-funded grant projects in a, a couple schools, um, building out some care navigator models and um, kind of integrating that into larger health and wellness programming in models of um, um, several high schools. Um, so hoping that, you know, we can really kind of marry some of the, the telehealth policy work with the, the school-based work and then as well, um, some of the expertise that um, my team brings just around electronic health records, thinking about data systems and really how, you know, technology can, can help support all this work as well. Um, I think I'll, I'll pass it over to Karina briefly just to introduce herself before, before we jump in anymore. Karina, I think you're muted. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> so hi, everyone. Um, my name is Karina Mendoza, Program Manager with Anthem Blue Cross. Um, and my role with the health plan is to offer um, and integrate telehealth solutions to providers and members within the communities we serve. Um, so later on in the presentation, I'll be sharing um, some of the plan's resources and programs that we have to offer to our school-based health centers. So uh, really excited to be here. With that, I'll go ahead and pass it back to you, Robbie. Thanks, Karina. And um, I think just before we jump in, Song, I'd love to, to make those three polls live that we have um, for the folks joining us today, just to get a sense for who everyone is, um, you know, where you, you might be at with developing your, your telehealth program, um, as well as um, your thoughts on, you know, where telehealth might um, best uh, suit student needs. Okay, I have made the polls live, so we should start seeing responses soon. Excellent. Thanks, Song. Awesome. And, and Song, should we maybe close out the polls or, or keep it open just a bit longer? Um, yeah, let's keep it open for a little bit longer. We have 25 attendees and about 10 votes coming in. So maybe another 30 seconds and then I'll read them out loud or you can if you see them and then we'll move on. Okay, perfect. Well, maybe in the meantime, while we leave it open, if we can move to the next slide. We can just review, you know, what 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 we'll go over today in terms of the agenda. Um, so a, a couple items, you know, first we'd love to start off with just an explanation of what telehealth is um, and really just kind of level set on, you know, why, why you might use telehealth with youth in particular. Um, from there, go into some key considerations for school telehealth programs, um, really thinking about, you know, some of those, those, those questions you want to ask as, as you're, you're building out or maybe, you know, building upon an existing program. And then additionally, you know, go over some, some telehealth models for schools that might be good uh, ways to kind of frame a reference and think about um, structuring a program at a school. From there, just a couple of policy considerations, you know, just to highlight some of the funding and regulatory changes coming down that I think are, could be seen as good opportunities to, to, to strengthen telehealth programming at schools. And then we'll shift into a coalition interview overview and one way to kind of think about taking advantage of some of these opportunities and forming partnerships in your communities. Um, and then I'll pass it over to Karina, who can who can give an overview from a health plan perspective around you know support and resources for uh, schools and children and adolescents. 
Um, so maybe with that, uh, Song, are we, are we good to go with the polls? Yeah, yeah. Would you like me to read them out or will you, or? Yeah, that'd would you be like great. Me to do it? Okay, got it. Okay. Um, yeah, so the first question, what type of organization do you represent? Um, we have 17% um, representing school or district, 23.5% uh, healthcare provider or system, and then 58% um, from other. So no health plan and no consumer group here. Um, for the second question, how would you assess your telehealth program? 33%, uh, so a third of us are here and we say we're using telehealth in our schools, so that's great. 40% um, um, said we're not currently using telehealth, but we are interested in learning more. 6.7% um, said, what's telehealth? So you've got some work cut out for you, Robbie, <laughs> Karina. And 20% um, said other. Um, and then the last question, um, for a primary purpose, do you believe telehealth has most promise to provide care to students at your school or in general? Um, and the responses are, um, I'll just read them kind of in order of, of the most. So the top one was behavioral health, 46.7%, followed by equally 20% health education and 20% non-clinical services or supports. And then um, the final two um, are primary care at 6.3%, reproductive sexual health at 6.3%. Um, and that is it. So thanks everyone participating. Excellent. And thanks thanks for reading those out and for um, responding to the poll. It sounds like we've got a good mix of people here today who are you know, familiar with telehealth and deep in it or are interested in learning more. And I think it's particularly interesting to the the, the responses on primary purpose. Um, so it wasn't surprising to see behavioral health kind of rise to the top, um, but I think it was also great to see that folks are also interested in thinking about how telehealth can support, you know, other services and supports or health education on campus as well. Um, so if we can forward to the third slide. Perfect, so what is telehealth? You know, I think to put it simply, telehealth is the use of technology to provide health services, um, health education, public health um, to individuals in the communities. Um, I think often we see different different uh, definitions out there. <clears throat> you know, the, the California Business and Professions Code, which is where our, our state telehealth definition lives in law, um, it, it's a little bit beefier than that, you know, referring to, you know, information and communication technologies. But I think in essence, it's really the use of tech to, to, to provide health. Um, and I think one way to, to, to kind of think about um, the different modalities and ways of using telehealth is, is this image, which was developed by the California Telehealth Policy Coalition in one of its uh, fact sheets last year. You know, I think one key way of thinking of it is you know, how can we increase access to specialty care, right? And two key ways of doing that are, um, you know, thinking about employing live video or audio only telehealth, right? So um, synchronous care between a, a patient and a provider, store and forward where um, a patient uh, is able to send their information remotely to, to a specialist. In that middle column, <clears throat> similarly, you know, thinking about how can we kind of um, improve patient-centered care. Again, I think that that top middle graphic, uh, direct-to-consumer, really speaks again to live video or audio-only care, where um, the patient often is able to initiate the care. And then that bottom one, too, around remote patient monitoring. So that's really the use of uh, devices or apps to um, allow for providers to remotely monitor patients, which could be a blood glucose monitor. It could be something like a blood pressure cuff as well. Um, often those are kind of connected to the internet and, and send that information back in real time to that person's healthcare provider. And then on the far right, you know, thinking about how, do, how can we sort of reduce specialty referrals where they're not necessarily always needed, right? And improve access to care and again, reinforce the, the medical home. Um, I think one, one way of doing that at the top right is through distance learning. So some of you might be uh, familiar or not familiar with Project ECHO. Um, that's a model where specialists often in urban areas are able to provide education remotely 
um, but synchronously to, you know, PCPs or sometimes specialists as well, who may be in a rural or um, um, underserved areas, right, where there may be provider short shortages to help um, upskill those providers. Um, the model really developed out of New Mexico and, and really is spread around the country in a lot of different uh, universities, academic medical centers are deploying this model now to be able to, to help um, train and, and upskill providers in, in areas around them. And then on the bottom right is eConsult. So these are provider to provider asynchronous messages um, back and forth. So, um, uh, and we'll get to eConsult, I think later in this presentation too. Um, but one way to think about it is, you know, a PCP is treating a patient, has a question ar around a dermatologic issue, and knows that the patient might have to wait five months to, to get in with a dermatologist. They can remotely send a message to um, a, a dermatologist using a, you know, a secure platform and usually get a response back in a day or two. Um, and often, you know, the response back is from the specialist is, hey, here's how you can help manage this individual's care. Um, as the primary care provider, um, you know, keep us posted if, if, if care becomes, um, if you have more questions, you know, send another e-consult and then, you know, the recommendation further down the line could be to, to place that patient in the queue for a specialty visit. Um, so moving to the next slide, you know, why might we use telehealth with youth? Uh, I think we've seen throughout the pandemic, everyone it, it, to, to large extents or degrees and in some ways either are using telehealth or know people who are t using telehealth now. I think three years ago, it, it, those numbers were so much lower. Um, and I think in particular, you know, a lot of the popular media and increasingly research is, is highlighting that, you know, young people often are more comfortable using tech for everyday needs and tasks, um, so health related and otherwise as well. Um, and, and increasingly, a lot of surveys are showing that you know young people are seeking out health information online or seeking out healthcare online too. Um, so whether that's you know through kind of direct to consumer telehealth, if you will, through vendors, it can also be through um, you know their regular community providers as well. Um, and that, you know, as well, they, they often expect this from healthcare providers that they are offering telehealth as, as a modality to, you know, augment or supplement in-person care. Um, <clears throat> I think additionally, you know, there's potential for technology to create meaningful relationships between youth and providers or, you know, in a, in a health education setting that could be between youth and a health educator or maybe it's a, a mentor, whether a peer or otherwise. Um, you know, obviously, if used in the right way, it can it can it can strengthen those relationships. Um, and then, additionally, um, I think uh, you know, tech also has the ability to increase access to care. So we definitely saw that during COVID. Um, but I I would argue too that that's the case beyond public health emergencies as well. Right? We know that a lot of people, including youth, face um, barriers to getting to in-person visits. That could be transportation and, you know, for youth who may not be able to drive or have access to a car, um, you know, they, they may have to take several bus rides to see a provider, right? So that's where I think, you know, often the value of school health comes up. And um, I think to take it a step further, right, thinking about after hours care and, and, and how can youth, you know, potentially access care maybe when they're not at school. Um, as well. So um, I think there's there's a real kind of access and relatedly um, equity argument to be made around, you know, providing telehealth to youth um, um, in particular. So um, and feel free throughout the presentation as well to put any questions in the Q&A or the chat. We'll make sure we're monitoring those and are happy to answer throughout. So moving to the next slide. <clears throat> what are some key key considerations or, or questions to kind of ask yourself as you're starting up a program? Um, so I think, you know, a key one to start with when you're kind of thinking strategically is, you know, what, what when it comes to health and wellness or your, your um, uh, school or district or organization's priorities, right? So thinking about question, uh, ways to kind of phrase it that maybe don't even include telehealth in them, right? But thinking about, we wanna increase access to care generally for our students. 
Um, it also could be, you know, our health plan partners. They really want to improve the quality of the care um, that they're providing right to meet, you know, their regulatory needs, um, expand access. Um, it also could be we want to rethink and transform how we provide care to our students. So a little more, you know, kind of blue sky there, if you will. But, you know, I think starting with that, you know, what is what is your vision and your mission when it comes to meeting students' needs and having that, I think, be that initial question that, that you seek to answer. Uh, I, you know, additionally, I, I, another good question to pose is why is telehealth critical to your strategic priorities, right? So the example here, telehealth can enable our contracted mental health providers to provide after, after school care remotely. Um, and, you know, that could also be amended to provide you know, care to students during public health emergencies when they're not on campus. Uh, and additionally, you know, thinking really carefully about who are your target students for telehealth. Um, and that could be within programs, that could be within specific student populations, and thinking too about those services and supports that they need, right? So in the example here, we need telehealth to enhance wraparound health services and case management, for newcomer students in grades six to eight, whose primary language in Span is Spanish, right? And I, I bolded some of these words here just to point out, highlight, you know, what, what kind of the key things I think that pop out here are, right? But we're gonna need health services. We might kind of refine those to specify it could be mental health, it could be physical health, case management. So that's another thing that stands out that may have implications for the providers that we're engaging or how we're capturing data and where. Um, newcomer students, right? So that may that may um, cause us to think about, are we providing care in a, a culturally appropriate way? Um, making sure, I think, and this is across any student population, <clears throat> if you know the students may need internet access or access to devices, um, as well as you know uh, confidentiality uh, considerations as well. Um, grade six to eight, so I think thinking about age, and again, this gets to things like um, consent, you know, and, and does minor consent apply? What services are being provided? Um, as, as well as, you know, uh, can we advertise this program in a, a, in a way that's friendly to students who are in grades six to eight? And then lastly, you know, this, this population is listed as primarily speaking Spanish. So will the providers, are they um, able to speak Spanish? Do we need a, an interpreter to come in? Um, do, we need, do we need to make sure our marketing materials are also in Spanish as well so that we can make sure, you know, we're driving students to the program, um, you know, in, in, in advertising in a way that's, that speaks to them. Uh, so the next slide. A couple other questions to, to in, in categories to think about as well. I think a key one is thinking about how telehealth fits into your larger model of care on campus. So I know a lot of a lot of schools, you know, have MTSS structures. Some have uh, wellness center models. Some have more traditional school-based health center models. Um, others are deploying, you know, coordination of services teams or cost teams, right? So there's there's all these different models and frameworks being deployed on campus. And I think a key question to, to think about is, you know, how can telehealth support your existing care models um, and really strengthen them, right? So that could be, that could be um, allowing case managers who are plugged into a, a cost team on campus to be able to use telehealth to do follow-up visits with, with students for check-ins. Um, you know, if you're working in a, in a, a, a wellness center model, it could be how do we get our CBO partners to use telehealth and are they going to use our school's platform? Do they need their own? And things like that. And thinking about, I think, across your programs, how telehealth or technology in general might be able to, to support your programs. Um, and I think in a, a related one, you know, many schools have physical spaces on campus that can serve as an access point, right? Where students, one, could find information about telehealth services, but also can actually access services too. Um, and we'll discuss that more, you know, around the model you're thinking about, but, you know, 
I think a good key upfront question is, do you have physical space where students can, can find out about telehealth, could be, you know, sort of funneled to telehealth potentially, depending on what your needs are and the, the type of program you're pursuing. Um, and so related to that, you know, who's staffing um, this work? Um, who, who's, is there someone who's gonna be a coordinator who kind of owns your telehealth if, program, if you will? Or is it maybe more diffuse, right? So you may, um, you may have multiple people who are responsible, if you will, for, for telehealth at your school. And that, that could be a program manager. It also could be <clears throat> someone who's thinking about billing, right? If that's something that your school is able and willing and wanting to do. Um, another could be scheduling, right? So how are telehealth appointments being scheduled? Is that in your traditional workflow? that you already have for in-person services? Do you need a separate workflow for uh, telehealth visits because you're using um, a vendor maybe that, that only provides services via telehealth? So maybe you have two scheduling systems. Um, and also too, how are you assisting families and students with using technology, understanding what your program is, how to use it, um, I think one thing we've learned throughout the pandemic is that, you know, digital literacy is, is a key issue. And even though, you know, uh, at this point, most people have uh, cell phones, if not smartphones, and, and can access care, you know, kind of onboarding onto telehealth, knowing how to use it, thinking about, you know, being in a quiet place um, where you can confidentially meet with a provider, things like that. A lot of those nuances, you know, do, do you have a staff person or, uh, who can who can help with that, or is that kind of embedded again into existing roles, right? Where a, a case manager or clinician maybe can incorporate that into some of the the advice that they're giving to to their students that they meet with, or you know, provide it through a text message to a patient or a client. Um, and then additionally, your your provider network. So, are you looking to sort of augment your existing program with telehealth? or are you looking to supplement with telehealth? So I think with Augment, right, you know, can we take our existing in-person network or providers right on campus and add telehealth as a capability for them to provide services? Or do we not even have these providers and we're looking to add on, you know, a remote panel, if you will, of providers, um, and often that's using a third-party telehealth company, right? But, but thinking about, you know, who, who, who do you want to leverage to provide these services? And, and some of that, I think, will flow from what your students' needs are. Um, and so, you know, that last question, too, thinking about, I think, carefully, do you want to use your local provider network that I think ha often in many cases have strengths to them, right? They, they know where to provide local referrals. Um, they may be plugged in, uh, you know, into the community and, and be able to kind of help uh, better coordinate care and reinforce the patient-centered medical home? Or do you want to use a vendor, a third-party company, that I think also can, can, can in some ways, um, um, reinforce the medical home as well and often have, you know, um, more advanced data capabilities, right, and are using electronic health records and actually may be able to get that, that data back to the, uh, the child's pediatrician or uh, other mental health provider, right, to coordinate care. Um, but, you know, I think, I think often those, those um, have to be structured and, and made clear up front. But so I think thinking about, you know, do you, can you bring in local providers to do the work? If not, do we need remote ones to come in? And, and what does that look like? Who's, who, who's the network behind, behind the services? Um, and, and what are your needs? What can you kind of leverage that you already have? And, and what might a vendor might, uh, be able to provide to you? Um, so last slide, before we get to some of the technical uh, pieces, you know, back to that first slide I showed with the different modalities, you know, think about which of those might be best for, to meet your students' needs, right? So you might think, would audio only or live video meet the needs? Um, I think we've seen throughout the pandemic that audio only care uh, really can provide a lot of benefit that often, you know, patients or clients don't need to be on live video. Um, to 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 receive the care that they get, um, or do you need, do you want um, an asynchronous modality, or 
would an asynchronous modality maybe complement what you're doing via live video, right? So think about, you know, can we do live video with, with our students and maybe we have e-consult available so that, you know, if the mental health provider has a more advanced uh, question and they're not sure how to handle the, the student's care, maybe they can send a remote message to a psychiatrist um, or another therapist um, remotely. Um, and so relatedly, how can other solutions help your staff or providers with skill building? I think that gets to, you know, Project Echo or things like eConsult, right, where you can, you can help build up the skills of your providers and um, be able to, to help reinforce the, the patient-centered medical home, right, and, and make sure that those frontline providers um, are, are able to build up the skills um, that they often want and need to be able to, to provide even better care to their patients. Uh, additionally, so student location, where are your students going to be accessing these services? Obviously, during the pandemic, that was almost all at home, right? Or maybe Starbucks, if the student didn't have good internet access and had a live video appointment. Um, but are you thinking of doing it at school? Um, or, or is it somewhere else? Is it an after school program, you know, at a community center? So I think thinking carefully about where, where the student's going to be receiving the services, because that might dictate um, some of those technology focused considerations as well. And marketing and communications, I brought this up a little bit, but how are you going to advertise this program? I think often with um, all, you know, telehealth programs in the past that are not well advertised, people don't use them, right? Um, and I think that goes for other, you know, health and wellness programming too. If we don't, if we don't um, alert people to it, um, if we don't uh, make sure to, uh, you know, make those materials available in, uh, you know, accessible ways or in languages that, you know, our students speak, um, people won't use them. And I think relatedly, think about how you can leverage your partners or if you're using a vendor, how can they help with your marketing materials? Do they have templates you can use and, you know, manipulate to meet your students' needs, uh, make them ADA compliant and such or translate them? Um, I think as well, you know, beyond just like print advertising, how can you get the word out through word of mouth, right? Or through maybe social media as well, um, through Instagram or Facebook, um, if, you're, if your school has those accounts. And then I think lastly, this is a key one that comes up a lot, right? Um, I, you know, uh, uh, is funding partnerships and sustainability. You know, and I, I think as we'll get to in this presentation, as I'm sure you've already heard in some of the other presentations, a lot of money is coming out from the state to help support school health. And increasingly, health plans are going to be involved in this work. Um, I'm sure the questions raised, you know, how how will we sustain this work in the long term, though, if, um, you know, funding is time limited or I only have this grant for three years, right? So I think thinking carefully around, OK, how can we pay for this program now? Um, but thinking as well around how can we maybe create collaboratives or coalitions with partners in the community. So that could be health plans, providers, um, foundations, right? To, to, I think, you know, build momentum, create awareness, and also to, to help support that sustainability in the long term. Um, I think forming those relationships early and often, and we'll get to some of those nuts and bolts. Um, but that's another key thing to think about. Um, and I think relatedly, when it comes to funding um, and related to all of this, you know, funding coming out and thinking about, man, I'm a school health center and I would love to partner with a health plan. But how do I do that? I think a key thing is thinking about, you know, data and billing capabilities. Um, you know, health plans work on, you know, billing CPT codes. So that's common procedural terminology, right, for, for billing for health services. I think some some school health centers are, are well versed in this and already may be billing or their partners are billing and some may be newer to this. Um, but thinking about, you know, if you're working with a vendor, do they have the capability to 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 code for services um, or produce an invoice so that you can you can export that file and send it to, you know, another contractor who can help you with billing. Um, and relatedly, are there creative ways that you can think about drawing down other grant opportunities coming out. So a lot of funding's coming out for broadband, um, 
for telehealth and often through agencies that we don't think of, right? So USDA, if you're in a rural area, actually has quite a few um, funding opportunities for telehealth and for broadband. So I think keeping keeping your ear to the ground to, to, to look out for those opportunities. And I think often to look, look in places that you wouldn't think to look um, because sometimes, you know, that, that funding is, is housed within agencies that aren't those traditional health agencies that we think of. Um, so one more slide just on, you know, these key considerations are some of those technology considerations if you're assessing a vendor. And these might, these might vary depending on, you know, what you're looking for in a vendor. That could be, you know, a vendor that has, uh, that comes with a panel of providers. Um, it may just be a vendor kind of like Zoom, right, where you're just looking for technology. Um, but, but here are some of those general questions to ask. I think first is like platform features, right? Um, what type of telehealth is your program, program interested in, right? So that gets to the modalities and does that vendor have these features? Can they do live video? Can they do asynchronous? Um, is this only for providers to use or for patients as well? Um, in terms of contracting, if you're, you already have, you know, CBOs or other healthcare providers engaged, who's going to hold that contract? Is it the school or the provider? And I think that gets to some of those, those issues that arise around, you know, HIPAA versus FERPA. Um, so I think just thinking carefully around who's going to hold the contract and what, um, what kind of ramifications might that have for the providers I'm roping in? Um, if I have a CBO who's subject to HIPAA, but my platform's are only FERPA compliant, um, you might just think about getting a two for one if you can and, and asking that question of your vendors. But I think that's like a key one that, that may come up in the, the contracting process. Uh, language access. So, you know, if, if this, this vendor has those remote providers that you're gonna utilize, uh, in what languages are their services offered? Do they have um, interpreters at the ready or are you gonna have to bring in another uh, vendor for that? So thinking through those questions. I think another is internet connectivity. Uh, you know, I think again, we've seen during the pandemic that broadband access is lacking, not just in rural areas, but urban areas too. And um, I've been on several big meetings this week where we've been losing panelists. I, I know several folks, you know, turn off their videos earlier to, to save on our bandwidth. And I think these are, these are really, this is a really critical question to ask. So if, if you're going to be providing services at school, do you have the, the broadband bandwidth to, to not only, um, you know, maybe have other classes on the internet or, um, you know, be able to like stream videos in classrooms, but also do, you know, several telehealth visits at the same time. Um, you know, where, where, where is the, the student going to be accessing telehealth and where do you need that connectivity? Um, and if the students are going to be accessing telehealth remotely, uh, you know, at asking like, do they have adequate access to broadband? Um, do we need hotspots? Um, and, and additionally, you know, do, do the students have the access to the devices that they need to, to access telehealth as well? Um, additionally, consent. So uh, if you're working with a vendor that has its own data management system, you know, how is I, a good question to ask is how is consent captured? Is it, is it in the, the, the platform? Is it in the EHR? Um, how is that captured? How are they consenting? Uh, you know, you may want to ask some of those state specific questions around minor consent, if that applies to the services that you're providing. Um, and so I think asking those questions throughout the process are important. Privacy and security, I think, as I mentioned, HIPAA and, secure, uh, HIPAA and FERPA are good ones to ask, but also, too, things like encryption, right, or user access controls. Who's going to have access to, to this health data? Um, can, can the school, uh, you know, set up a system with user controls, both for the vendor and for the school, and then maybe your provider partners as well? Um, and then lastly, software integration and coordination. So I think thinking about, you know, are you already using a data management system, right? So that could be an EHR, it could be a case management system. 
can that integrate with your telehealth vendor? If, if you're just looking for, say, a Zoom platform, can it integrate with the, the current place where you're, you're charting notes and, and capturing that data right now? Um, do you, does it have things like single sign-on um, so that you know, your providers aren't signing into multiple systems? Um, can it? Can you code for billing purposes or to capture ICD-10 codes, right? So thinking again to like partnering with health plans or healthcare providers, right, who think in CPT and ICD codes. And then also to, you know, um, are you, can you, can you share clinical notes with local providers? Um, I think something that's coming up increasingly, as I mentioned, is, you know, a focus on care coordination and reinforcing the patient's medical home. So thinking about if if we in a, if we implement a data management system at our school, does it have the uh, the the capability to share records back out with providers in the community, whether that's a primary care provider or a mental health one? Um, you know, we you may not be there today, and this may be a question that you ask a year or two into the 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 program to actually go live. But I think asking it up front is an important question to understand you know, where can we go in terms of integration to be able to support our students and make sure that, you know, care is better coordinated and, you know, as much as we can, we're creating those longitudinal records, right? So that we're not duplicating efforts and that, you know, um, if a student's needs are being met at school by one provider that, you know, there are other community providers are aware of what's going on as well. Um, I'd love to stop there and see, uh, Song, if there any questions are coming in at all. Uh, not yet. Awesome. Well, thank you, thank you, and and feel free to drop any in in the chat or the Q and A as as we go on to. Um. So I think moving on to the next section, just a couple. These are really I think high level models for thinking about telehealth in your schools. Um. Just on the next slide. So one is you know I think thinking about what I'd call like a clinic sponsored model. So partnering often with like a FQHC or RHC to provide care. The second I think is the school or other community provider sponsored model. So that could be with a CBO or a health system, um, a social services agency. And then the third is um, I think a more purely vendor sponsored one or third party telehealth company sponsored one. I guess the, this, the big asterisk I would apply to this is that you know, I think I'm I'm delineating between the three of these just to kind of conceptually get get the point across that there are different ways to kind of structure your program. But all to say that I think often schools are employing mixed mixed models, right? I think there's no purely one size fits all probably to meet all of your school's needs. There may be, but often I think schools are are cobbling together these different models. But this is just to get you thinking, I think, in different ways of how you can partner with different uh, providers or companies, right, to, to provide telehealth on campus. So moving to the next slide, just around, you know, a clinic sponsored one. I think this, the, in this example, it's really focused on partnering with a federally qualified health center or rural health center. Um, you know, that often, I think in many cases, co-locates, right, and has a clinic location on the campus and may have telehealth capabilities. Right, so here you're really relying on that clinic for their provider network. Um, and in terms of, you know, thinking about payment, right, um, and the money, um, you know, the, the payment model may, um, may vary, but, uh, you know, generally, the, I mean, these health centers have billing capabilities, right? So that's one thing to think about um, when you're assessing whether your partner has billing capabilities. Um, you know, and often FQHCs and RHCs pay at their prospective payment system rate um, if they're billing Medi-Cal. And then they may be in network as well with commercial um, plans or be able to refer students out who are on those commercial plans. So I think that's something else to look into too. I think often we think of FQs and RHCs as really serving Medi-Cal patients, but often they are in network um, increasingly I'm seeing with commercial health plans as well. So they may be able to serve, you know, and, and bill for the services provided to a wide, um, widespread um, uh, population of students. Um, I think often they, they already have telehealth vendors that they're using, you know, more with um, their patients more generally, but 
Um, I think that's that's sort of a generalization, but um, they often do already have a, a vendor they're using to provide services. Um, and they do, you know, have an electronic health record already as well. I know, you know, in a lot of school settings, you know, partners are, are both charting in their system as well as the schools. Um, but, you know, they, the EHR likely could integrate with a, a telehealth platform or maybe another one at the school as well. And just as an example here, you know, from, from during COVID, from La Clinica in, in Oakland, you know, they developed a, a phone triage line for youth um, in Oakland during COVID and it made video and phone and text available to, to students within the district. Um, and that included clinical services and health education as well. Um, and they, they use a, a version of Epic um, electronic health record to, to capture that data. So this is just, just one example of thinking about kind of a, a telehealth program with, with a clinic partner. I think moving to the next slide, in terms of kind of thinking more generally around, you know, other community provider sponsored models or maybe using FTEs employed by the school, um, that's really where I think some of these, these, this example might be helpful, you know, where you're partnering with a lo local social services agency, or it could be, um, you know, utilizing your in-house staff to provide services through telehealth. Um, you, you know, the payment model likely varies in this model too, might include FQHCs providing services on campus. I know often schools are paying clinics um, to provide services to students on campus and it's not through like the, the co-located model. Um, in terms of vendor platform management, you know, I think this can look very different depending on the model. So it could be using a school's platform. It could be through the CBO or other healthcare providers platform. I think it'll just vary depending on what your need is and what your program looks like. And then I, I think that uh, that speaks to the, you know, EHR or data management piece as well. Um, you know, I, I know that often varies. And, and to provide an example from the Tamil Pius Union High School District in, in Marin and in their wellness center, they, they engage um, FTEs as well as uh, local CBOs um, local FQHCs as well, um, who come to campus and, and provide services and coordinate services. And there is staff on, on campus that schedule that manages the scheduling and, and referrals to those contracted partners. Um, but those CBO partners do, you know, capture notes both in the school's system, which is Salesforce, as well as the CBO system as well. So data is being uh, stored and managed in, in multiple places. Um, and in this model, they're not they're not billing for services right now. So it, it's all being funded from in-kind donations, general funds, drawing down grant funds as well. Um, so I think that speaks to that that funding question around you know billing and, and capabilities. And while I think some of the data management systems do have billing capabilities, um, you know this program isn't isn't quite at that that point in doing that quite yet. Um, and then the last example is just around a vendor sponsored model. I think so, uh, you know, theoretically this one is, is, is pretty straightforward. You bring in a vendor and they have a remote panel of providers or, or specialists that they bring in. Um, you know, their payment model may vary. They, they may very well be able to bill, um, but I know often schools are paying out of pocket or through grant funded programs to, to pay for, um, you know, third party uh, telehealth providers to to render services they generally have an ehr already um sometimes they're proprietary or they're using one of the more common electronic health record systems uh, in this example here in san bernardino you know they're they're engaged with uh, hazel health um, which is a telehealth startup focused on schools um, to provide you know remote uh, care to students on campus um, and um, they provide the equipment. They've got, you know, a telehealth cart um, and iPads that they that they provide to the school. Um, and right now, it's being paid using grant funding. In other models, um, health plans are partnering with schools to help pay for, uh, you know, vendors to come. I think, um, as you'll hear from Karina in a little, um, there are some opportunities available with Anthem. So I think this model can as well has some some different permutations, if you will. 
Um, but I, I think this is one other, you know, kind of model to, to consider as well. So moving to the next slide. So thinking about, okay, how do we pay for this? What's coming down the pike? I, I know there have already been policy sessions and, and updates, so I won't belabor the point, but I just highlight here a couple of the, the different opportunities or regulatory requirements coming down the pike, just to showcase where there may be opportunity to either fund or you know bring in partners because new requirements are being imposed on them. So I think the first is you know the big children and youth behavioral health initiative, right? There are fun there's funding coming out for school infrastructure grants, as well as um, a new behavioral health services platform being rolled out by the Department of Healthcare Services with eConsult. So how can you leverage that at your um, in your telehealth program? Um, as well as they're going to come out with a new statewide fee schedule for school-based services in Medi-Cal. Um, and the managed care plans are, are going to be rolling out incentive payments um, for behavioral health in schools. So I think these are all key ways to think about, one, how can you kind of influence the process, right, and make sure telehealth is, is either called out or, you know, at the least um, um, being acknowledged or it can be included in these programs. Um, and additionally, being able to, to draw down funds as well and, and keeping an eye out for those opportunities as they arise. Two others I'll point out. So through the Department of Managed Healthcare, this is the, the state agency that regulates most of our private or commercial health plans or health insurers. Um, so two, two things here. One is, again, through the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative, you know, health plans are going to be required um, um, you know, coming down the pike to start covering medically necessary treatment of mental health and substance use disorder services delivered at school sites, um, starting with contracts executed in 2024. So I think the departments, you know, they'll figure out a way to kind of roll that out and, and make sure um, to keep plans, you know, on track. But um, I think that's something to keep an eye out for. And another is just around this, this new health equity and quality benchmarking program that the Department of Managed Healthcare is also rolling out. You know, I think that the focus is on equity um, and how we bake that into how we measure quality for health plans. But I think this is another opportunity for schools and partners to weigh in, right, and, and make sure that, you know, maybe it's that youth metrics are in there or um, schools are considered in, what, uh, in one way or another. Um, and, and all that work starts up next year. And there'll likely be opportunities for public comment. So I think that's another way, right, to think about, um, you know, who are we, who are we partnering with? You know, how are our local health plans thinking about um, schools and youth as, as, you know, that health equity benchmarking system rolls out? Um, and, and how do we make sure we're accounted for in, in those programs too? Um, so I think that's all to say, you know, with funding and policy coming down the pike, this may necessitate the need to, to form new collaborations or coalitions. So moving to the next slide, just to, to highlight an example for you, and, and Karina will touch on this a bit as well. This is, a, this is an example from the Central Valley around the eConsult coalition that has been started up there um, with, with funding from the local health plans. So that includes Anthem and Calviva Health as well as um, HealthNet. Um, you know, to be able to engage local providers, um, particularly those in the safety net that are serving their Medi-Cal members to adopt and use e-consults. So those provider to provider remote consultations. Um, I highlight this here because I think this is a, a good sort of initial framework to highlight some of the nuts and bolts, both in terms of goal setting and activities that, you know, these sort of multi-payer, multi-provider, and I think in a school sense, you know, thinking about multi-school and also, you know, engaging student and youth voices in that as well is important um, to think about how to, you know, structure something like that. So one, you know, engage those providers and key community leaders that need to be plugged in. Um, you know, another is keeping an eye to like policy and reimbursement support. So are there opportunities to collectively coalesce around something like in this example, um, e-consult reimbursement for Medi-Cal providers. Um, is it around, you know, supporting billing workflows at schools, which, you know, I, I, I know can often be 
um, a particular pain point for schools. Um, you know, thirdly, thinking about demonstrating innovation and leadership. So, you know, doing things like standing up a website, creating newsletters, right, making sure that, um, you know, news gets out there and you're able to su sustain that support and that buy in from folks. I think related to that is, you know, thinking about like the data you can collect in dashboarding. Um, you'll see in this example, there's there's a Central Valley eConsult dashboard where uh, the various technology platform providers are, are sending data through the health plan partners that that we're able to stand up on a website um, to be able to highlight, you know, what patients are getting e-consults, what are their demographics and their age, where do they live and things like that, to be able to track that and share that with others. And then um, additionally, sharing, sharing the e-consult coalition model. So how can you share best practices and lessons learned from the Central Valley e-consult coalition? And I think that's a, a key thing that the, the coalition is continuously looking to do through through different venues um, and through the partners as well. So how can your partners, you know, make sure that they they bring light to your your collaborative in your area as well? Um, so just on the next slide, this is just to highlight, you know, a, a snapshot of who's who's involved in in this coalition. It's you know those three plans I mentioned as well as. Uh, almost all the local FQHCs and some of the um, other medical groups or IPAs that are providing care um, to medical uh, medical patients in the area, and you know they've all coalesced around this goal that you know all non-urgent or routine referral requests first go through an e-consult before you know that patient's placed in the queue. So moving to the next slide, one other thing to highlight too is just around. Um, you know, uh, the dashboard example. So moving to the next slide, you can see there's there's a dashboard live where the coalition is tracking by specialty, you know, um, like where where are we seeing utilization for e-consult? You can see in this example, like neurology and ortho and cardiology are of high need, right? So that that may tell us that I think gives us insights into where there are real specialty needs across these health plans and across these providers within the Medi-Cal population in these four counties in the Central Valley. Other demographics are also being captured too. So things like uh, patient reported race or ethnicity, um, language preference, age as well. All to again, I think give us insight into, you know, what are the needs by, you know, language access or, um, you know, other demographics. Um, so this is, I think, something that's exciting that's been stood up and, you know, maybe applicable to when you're, if you're thinking about forming a coalition or collaborative as well, um, thinking about how you're capturing data across your participants so that that can really inform, you know, not only your work, but um, policymakers work as well. Um, and then just the next slide, this is just one other example, you know, the, the Central Valley Council Coalition's also been providing CMEs to, to providers, right? So I think another thing, when you're thinking of like keeping your, your folks engaged and, um, you know, demonstrating program innovation and leadership, how can you incorporate CME or, or continuous education into the work as well? Is there a way that you can partner with schools um, um, with teacher trainings, right, to incorporate health and wellness programming into, um, into their opportunities as well. And then lastly, on my last slide, and then I'll hand it over to Karina shortly. Um, these are a couple take home messages for folks I, I just thought we could share. Um, you know, I think the first is like, let your school strategy and especially your students' health needs really shape your telehealth program. So I think really start from having those discussions with, you know, your leadership and your staff and your community partners and your students, right? To understand what is it you need and how can telehealth support it? I think the second is to understand how can technology best support existing programming? So rather than seeing, I think telehealth is something completely separate from in-person care, right? Thinking of healthcare is something holistic that encompasses both in-person and telehealth and understanding how telehealth can, you know, help, help to augment and supplement the care that's already being delivered on campus. 
Thirdly, um, as I was just mentioning, you know, consider coalition building and other partnership models. You know, how can you how can you bring in your health plan partners and your provider partners um, to help you manage or fund this work or, um, you know, I think help sustain it as well. And how can these help build momentum and sustainability for your program and other programs too, right? And thinking about how you can, you know, across schools or districts, right, create collaboratives where you can share those best practices and learn from each other and build build policy momentum and change as well. Um, and I think this is a good way to 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 bring everyone to the table to to understand where there are needs and challenges and collectively kind of come to solutions. And then lastly. You know, I think a key thing, keep monitoring policy developments. I know that the School-Based Health Alliance does an amazing job of this, um, but, you know, keep your eye out for um, the funding that's coming out or different opportunities to engage with your health plans. There's a lot going on, in especially within our Medi-Cal program. Change is not coming through just through the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative, but things like CalAIM. I'm sure many of you, have you been hearing about ad nauseum? And, you know, thinking about how can schools play a, a key role as a, a referral point for, you know, enhanced care management or in lieu of services. So I think think creatively about different ways you can plug into policy or draw down funding. Um, and I think I think keep keep your ear to the ground when those opportunities arise. Um, and I see one question came through from Song. I mentioned Hazel Health is one of the vendors. What are other ones that schools are using? Um, I've heard a lot of schools using Zoom as a as a, a telehealth platform to to access um, telehealth as well. I think um, Karina will go over some as well. I think Tido Care is is another key one that um, I'm familiar with as well. Um, um, and happy to to follow up with um, maybe other questions or, or uh, you know vendor questions that come up too. Um, but Karina, I'll, I'll hand it over to you at this point. All right, thank you so much, um, Bobby. That was some wonderful information that you just shared. Um, so before I dive into um, the rest of my slides, I would just like to say that um, it really does take a village to raise a child. This is something that my dad would say to me occasionally growing up. Oftentimes it was when my dad was running late after his hour and a half commute from work um, to pick me up from my after school program. So it also hit me most when he told me again when I had my first child, it's going to take a village, Miha, <laughs> as I was holding my daughter. Um, so my child is now five and uh, just started school. So experiencing myself, um, just being a single parent while working and juggling schedules. Um, I realize how important this statement is um, that it takes a village to raise a child and what this means to not only the child, uh, but the parent. So incorporating physical and behavioral health care access into the school system will help keep children, parents and teachers informed for avenues of care. Um, so I'm, let's bring in together the different households of the community and create an integrated practice model for children at school. Um, I'm so extremely uh, happy and excited to be a part of this village today and be here today to take part in the conversation of ensuring healthcare is accessible and equitable within our communities. Next slide, please, please. So again, my name is Karina Mendoza and I'm a program manager with Anthem Blue Cross leading um, the telehealth programs for the plan. Um, Anthem provides healthcare coverage to 1.3 million members across 29 counties. Um, and Anthem really has been forming itself to be a digital first company and um, making technology accessible by bringing the care to the patient at the right place at the right time. Next slide. So why school-based telehealth? Um, identifying health concerns early on, especially addressing the behavioral and mental health concerns um, and making sure kids are not being left behind and instead being seen and heard is extremely important. Um, so educating teachers and staff on cultural differences and um, how that comes into play with learning in the classroom for students is extremely important. So um, 
I come from a very small rural community myself. And in my past role, I took a position as a telehealth coordinator um, in the next town over, uh, which was even more rural. If you're familiar with Madera County and Mariposa County, um, even the in-between drive was about 30 minutes. So where I worked at in my past role, there was one clinic and one critical access hospital uh, for the whole community. So um, there was uh, oftentimes a lot of patients were still having to travel 30 minutes to get to that clinic. And um, one thing that I ran into a lot was um, parents would be trying to schedule appointments for their kids. Um, for um, I ran the behavioral health and uh, for psychiatry uh, telehealth program there. So when parents would try to schedule appointments for um, their kids, they weren't able to take off work. Um, they weren't able to pull them out of school. You know, they, they just couldn't miss work. So a lot of times we'd get no shows. And so I started to think like, how can we, how can we avoid this? And I really wanted to um, build out a school telehealth program within that community. And um, it, we just couldn't do it because of all the billing restrictions at the time. This was a couple of years back, but obviously now we know that with COVID, all those restrictions have been lifted and um, the public health emergency and with all of that has been extended out to 2022 to have all these relaxed um, um, restrictions, you know, open now so we can actually do remote care uh, for Medi-Cal patients. So, um, so that's, it's been inc incredible. And when I say why school-based telehealth, it's kind of like, um, why, why is it taking so long? <laughs> so I'm really excited to, um, just talk more about this and how um, how we can make this healthcare access on school campus be um, a part of our children's future and make them aware of how important it is to take care of yourself at an early age. Um, so with that, um, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so, all of these um, school telehealth and um, school-based programs are all really great, but when it comes to embedding it into the school system, uh, payer support and coverage comes into play, right, as Robbie mentioned. So um, here's an example that he did go over a little bit about the Central Valley E-Consult Coalition and the payer collaboration. Um, so Anthem, along with um, other managed care organizations, Calviva and HealthNet, came together to form um, an e-consult coalition. So this group, this coalition is facilitated by Blue Path Health. And um, what the payers have done is made uh, um, e-consults accessible to FQHCs, um, RHCs, and in health centers um, to utilize e-consults and adopt them into their practice at no cost. So e-consults are something that um, FQHCs, RHCs, and Indian Health Centers cannot bill for, um, but e-consults are very valuable um, to use, especially in the as a first step in the referral process um, to expand um, access to care for um, specialty care. So typically a referral coordinator would link Medicaid patients in need of a specialty consult with specialists but obviously that can be really challenging due to the network challenges just in the Medicaid network in general. Um, so e-consults really do support that provider to provider communication, um, leading the PCP to comfortably handle um, treatment for patients and avoid unnecessary face-to-face -face visits. So um, this is just one example of payer collaboration of all the plans coming together and seeing the benefit of e-consults and um, saying, you know, forget competition, let's do, do co-opetition instead. <laughs> um, that's what my uh, past manager would say when we first um, launched this. So we really took a grassroots approach here on just forming this and putting this together. Uh, we've also included um, the UCSF Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Portal um, into this program and offered to the clinics that are participating in this um, Central Valley E-Consult Coalition. So the UCSF Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Portal is um, was funded through Prop 56 um, DHCS funds. 
and it allows for um, UCSF to expand access um, to the Central Valley through e-consults and um, almost near time on-demand telephonic consults. So a PCP can either pick up the phone and call the UCSF psychiatrist for uh, recommendations on treatment to care for um, a patient age zero to 18, or they can send an e-consult. So um, this is no cost to all um, Medi-Cal children in the Central Valley, uh, Madera, Fresno, Kings, and Tulare. Um, and this program is also um, already been active in 30 other states. And um, I just got word yesterday that the UCSF team also is receiving additional HRSA funding to expand this program into other counties in California. So um, I think this is a really great program that a lot of uh, pediatricians or school-based health centers can take advantage of and um, use this to uh, connect with the UCSF psychiatrist to get recommendations on treatment. So. Um, as a second step to the e-consult and the teleconsultation um, is a one-time um, virtual visit with the UCSF psychologist. So that's that would actually be a one-time visit that's offered as a second step. So the patient or the student and the family can, you know, cons consult with them. And um, that's really neat. I mean, I, if it's urgent, that's something that can some be taken care of um, and scheduled immediately if, the, uh, if an FQHC is participating in this program. So um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight these two um, programs here that are um, you know, payer collaborative, showing payer support, and how it's making it easy for healthcare organizations to not have to um, kind of go through all the battles of seeing if a patient is covered and things like that. I mean, that's that takes a lot of work. So. Um, yeah, I did want to highlight these two programs. Um, and we can go to the next slide. So um, with keeping the payer collaboration and support um, top of mind, Anthem strives to make all of our programs payer agnostic. And um, we also make sure that all of the programs that we offer to our school-based health centers, FQHCs, um, and CBOs that, you know, the these programs are all accessible to any patient that or person that walks into their health center, they can use it. So um, this one first is our digital solutions kiosk program. Um, this again, it's available to use with all your patients and um, it increases access to primary care and specialty telehealth, uh, language barriers and improves multicultural patients overall health equity. So what Anthem is offering to our safety net clinics and school-based health centers and CBOs is um, a digital kiosk. So it comes on a rolling stand. Um, it has multiple video conferencing applications already pre-configured on the iPad itself. Um, so if I know there was a few uh, folks on the call today that don't have a telehealth solution yet. If you're a school-based health center, this might be something that um, you may be interested in. Uh, we're providing these at no cost. Uh, we really want to just expand the use um, and availability of telehealth um, within the school-based health centers. And I understand that some school-based health centers, they already have um, the pediatricians or, or the physicians on site at that school-based health center, right? So this can also be used to expand um, services outside of that school-based health center. So maybe there's another school nearby that doesn't have a school-based health center. You could place one of these kiosks there and um, students then at that campus can connect with your school-based health center and um, connect with those physicians there. So that's another way that these can be used um, through those telehealth applications. <clears throat> We also have um, Live Health Online, which is um, a virtual telehealth, our virtual telehealth provider platform. Um, they offer, they have medical um, and behavioral health providers available um, to have a visit with. Uh, the medical is 24-7, so if there's, a, you know, maybe the clinic is closed um, or it's after hours, this can be something um, for the medical, non-urgent, just for acute visits, maybe like a rash or something or cough, um, UTI even, like they can 
the medical physicians can be um, are available to schedule an appointment with, and then they can send a prescription over to the um, patient's pharmacy. So. Uh, for the psychiatry and psychology component of this, um, there, those visits do need to be scheduled, but the wait time isn't too bad. It's, I think, about four weeks to schedule an appointment. Um, and I will attach a flyer um, after, after this, but um, that will provide more details on the availability for the psychiatry and psychology. But overall, this is a really great program uh, or um, virtual telehealth provider platform that's no cost to Anthem members. Um, and can be downloaded on just your app, but it's uh, through an app on the Google Play or App Store, but it's also on the digital kiosk. So um, we also have the Bright Heart Health, which is another virtual telehealth provider that offers um, medication-assisted treatment for uh, patients experiencing opioid dependency. They also have a chronic pain program. Um, it's more of a holistic program. They do not prescribe any um, Schedule II or controlled substances through the chronic pain program, but they do offer um, a team of, of folks to follow the patient's care um, for that program, for all of their programs that they offer actually. And then um, mental health as well. So. This is also no cost um, and accessible to Anthem members on the iPads as well. And then um, lastly on the iPad kiosk, we also have the Anthem community resource link, uh, which is findhelp.org. This is just anybody who is looking for any resources, um, finding food, jobs, housing, and um, there's a lot of just great resources through this link, can be also accessed through the Safari browser on the iPads. So again, what we're offering here to our school-based health centers is um, the iPad kiosk. It comes on a rolling cart um, or choice of a rolling cart carrying um, case or a tabletop stand, brochure holder, and then the um, charging cable. So th this is a really great program that I encourage um, all of you on the call to take advantage of if you can. Um, and you can get in contact with me if, you, if there's any questions, but there's a lot um, available on these iPads that can be used and beneficial to, to um, a school campus. Yeah. Karina, um, I just want to let you know we have about two minutes left. Oh, okay. Go ahead and go on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so these last two slides that I'll go over are um, open for everyone, not just Anthem members. The first one is Shine Light on Depression. And this website brings together um, diverse organizations to amplify the conversation around childhood and teen depression and suicide. So if you go onto this website here, there's a tab. Um, you'll need to create an account at ericaslighthouse.org. But once you click on any of these um, resources here, classroom room, family engagement, or teen, emp teen empowerment, um, you can create an account and access all of their resources through these links. And then next slide. Um, this one is also available, um, what's up with opioids? It's available to anybody to use um, on school campuses or um, a lot of CBOs use this um, to have to facilitate their own um, classroom workshop. So they have all of like PowerPoints and worksheets for um, for someone at the community health center or um, at the school to use to uh, facilitate a class on opioids. So to inform students and follow along on um, how to be informed about that. So with that, I know I'm at time, um, sorry, but if there's any other questions regarding any of these programs, I encourage you to reach out to me um, and my emails on the slides. Yeah, thank you so much, Karina. And it's so wonderful to see a health plan like yours so involved in supporting school-based health centers um, in this work, because we definitely know this is really the future. You know, it's here now, but it's also the future. Um, and thank you so much, Bobby, for just a really comprehensive overview of where to start <laughs> or how to continue, you know, the path.